Howdy, howdy, this is Mr. Potter. In today's lesson, we're going to be talking about the mean value theorem, and we're going to be talking about when to tell, how to tell when a function is either increasing or decreasing. And this is really going to help connect with what we did in our previous lesson, which was is identifying local extrema, our relative extrema, and our absolute extrema. So, so I first want to start by talking about the mean value theorem. So the mean value theorem essentially says that if f is continuous, On some closed interval A B, B and, and differentiable on, on the open interval A B, B, then there exists a where A is less than or equal to B, B is less than or equal to C, such that F prime of C equals F of B minus F of A over B minus A. In other words, if I know that my function is continuous, and I know that my function is smooth on this interval from A to B, then I know that there is some place on that, that interval where the average rate of change is equal to the instantaneous rate of change. So our instantaneous rate of change is the derivative that we've talked about calculating in chapter 3. This average rate of change, this really is slope. This, this is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. I just get my y values by substituting points in, into my function. And what, what we're saying in essence is that, that when I do have a function that, that is continuous and differentiable, that means that if I if I was to take a look at this secant line, there's got to be at least one point on my graph where the tangent line has the exact same slope as the secant line. Now, there may be more than one, and that's perfectly fine. What the mean value theorem says is there has to be at least one. There has to exist a C. And there are certain functions, for example, a constant function, where every point in our domain is going to satisfy this mean value theorem. There will be situations where only one point will satisfy the mean value theorem. So, what I want to do is I want to start by going over a couple of examples of this mean value theorem. And the first one I'm going to do is y equals x squared on 
the domain 0 to 2. Now, y equals x squared is a, a polynomial function, so I know it's continuous on the closed interval 0, zero 2. And I also know that the derivative would be 2x, which is, is certainly continuous. It exists at every point on that open interval from 0 to 2. So we're satisfying the, the start of the mean value theorem that f is continuous on a closed interval, differentiable on an open interval. Now, what I'm saying is that if I take a look at 2c, that should be equal to f of b, which would be 2 squared, minus f of a, which would be 0 squared, over 2 minus 0. In other words, there's got to be a place in that interval where 2c equals 4 over 2. So if 2c equals 2, that means means c equals 1. And what, what this means is for the part of the parabola that I'm dealing with, a parabola that starts at the origin and only goes up, up to the point 2, 4. If, if I take a look at the secant line, there's got to be one place where the tangent line is equal to the secant line slope. And that point is going to be when x equals 1. So this mean value theorem helps me to identify that, that instant where the average rate of change equals the instantaneous rate of change. Now, for a parabola, that seems pretty intuitive. The idea is that the derivative is always going to be 2 times the independent variable, and we're used to seeing from, from situations in our physics class where the average rate of change equals the instantaneous rate of change exactly halfway through our journey. But I want to do one more example. I, I want to take a look at the function like y equals sine of x. I want to take a look at the in the closed interval from 0 to pi. So our derivative of this function would be cosine of x. And cosine of x is clearly defined on the open interval 0 to pi. It's differentiable at every point from 0 zero to pi. And so that means there must be a place where the cosine of C is equal to the sine of, of pi minus the sine of, of zero over pi minus zero. But the sine of pi is, is 0. 
0. Sine of 0 is 0. And so this fraction actually ends up being 0. And we know that if cosine of, of C equals 0, then our angle is pi over 2. And so if I take a look at the graph of sine from 0 to pi, my graph of sine is basically the top part of one period ending at pi. And this place at pi over 2 the place where the horizontal tangent, the tangent line, has an equal slope to the secant line, which is passing through 0, 0, and pi 0. So I found the place that satisfies the mean value theorem. Now, I could have just as easily made this uh, pi over 2, or I could have made this from negative 1 to 3. I could choose intervals that I want. Just realize that, you know, although the process is very straightforward, Sometimes the numbers that we get aren't very, very nice. Now, now, one point that I do want to make here is, is that we have to make sure that we satisfy these two conditions. First, that f has to be a continuous function on the closed interval, and it has to be different differentiable at every point on the open interval. So what I want to do next is I want to talk about what happens when one of those two conditions aren't met. And so I'm going to start with our most familiar uh, function that's not different differentiable on a closed interval, y equals the absolute value of x. So, of course, if I was to take a look at this, say on the interval negative 1, 1, my derivative has this weird behavior. Remember the, the v shape that we're talking about for the absolute group graph, absolute value graph, the slope is, is negative 1 for all values of x less than 0, and, and it's positive 1 for all values of x that's greater than 0. But, but at this point, at the origin, my, my slope is undefined. So what happens is my derivative ends up being equal to this 1, where x is greater than 0, and negative 1, where x is less than 0. But if I take a look at this part here, if I take a look at f of b minus f of a over b minus a, I'm going to end up with 1 minus 1 over 1 minus a negative 1. And I get a slope of 0. In other words, if I take a look at the absolute value graph from negative 1 
into positive one. And I take a look at the second line connecting these endpoints. I end up with a graph with a slope of zero. But there's no place on this V shape where the slope is equal to zero. Because my slope is either going to be equal to negative one for values of x less than zero, or equal to positive one for values of x that are greater than zero. And so the mean value theorem doesn't work because we're not not differentiable at the point x equals zero. That's our problem point there. So we're not satisfying the the condition that f had to be differentiable on the open interval because there's one point in there that messes it up. And one point is enough to completely frustrate us. The other situation that I want to take a look at is I want to take a look at where f was not a continuous function. And so I want to take a look at y equals the greatest integer function. Function. Remember, the greatest integer function is the integer that's the greatest integer that's less than or equal to a particular integer. And if I take a look at this on the graph from 0 to 1, I'm going to notice that my graph is at 0 and follows around at 0 until I hit 1. And at that point, it immediately jumps up, up to 1. So if I take a look at my, my derivative, my derivative is going to be equal to 0. Because all of the line segments for this graph are horizontal lines. As long as x is not an integer. Because if x is an integer, then I don't have the situation where my function is continuous. So the derivative does not exist at these points. But it doesn't exist because my function is not, not continuous at these points. But if I were to look at the slope of the secant line that would connect these points, I'm looking at a slope that has a rise of 1 and a run of 1. So my slope in this case is equal to 1. And there's no place where the derivative equals 1. So in this case, we're violating the idea that our function is continuous on this closed interval. I'm not continuous at the point x equals 1 because the limit does not exist at x equals 1. So for the mean value theorem to work, I have to be continuous on a closed interval and I have to be differentiable on the respective open interval.
And I've given two examples here, one which violates the continuity and one that violates differentiability on the interval that shows why these rules are essential. So that's the first thing that I want to talk about. I want to talk about this mean value theorem. Mean, of course, meaning average. So the next thing that I want to talk about is I want to talk about when a function is increasing and decreasing. So the first thing that I want to talk about is what do I mean by an increasing function? What I mean by an increasing function is if c is less than d, then f of c is less than f of d. So an increasing function given two points c and d, where c is less than d, the y value of d needs to be larger. That's what I mean by an increasing function. So when I talk about a function being increasing on an interval, I mean that for any two points c and d on that interval, if c is less than d, then f of c has to be less than f of d. And, and similarly, if I want to talk, talk about a function being decreasing for two points c and d in an interval, if, if c is less than d, then I want f of c to be larger than f of d. So for any two points in an interval where c is less than d, the d would have to have the lower y value. That's what I mean by increasing and decreasing respectively. But one of the things that we've talked about is derivatives. And we've talked a lot about these tangent lines. And if I take a look at a function that is increasing, if the derivative is defined for every point in this interval, then my derivative would have to be positive for every point in that interval. So if f prime is greater than 0, then f is increasing. And likewise, if f prime is less than 0, then f is decreasing. Now, now one of the things that we We've already talked about it is this notion of critical points. And so when I'm ta talking about a critical point, that's a situation where the derivative is equal to zero or the derivative. Derivative 
is undefined. So what I've done is I've, I've kind of taken, a, taken care of all the possible situations. Because my derivative is either going to be equal to zero, or larger than zero, or smaller than zero, or it's not, not going to exist. These are the four situations that I, I could have have for the derivative of a particular function. And one of the th things that we talked about last time with regards to critical points is that, that critical points are the only place where relative extrema can occur. If a critical point is the only place where relative extrema can occur, that means that that's the only place where maximums or minimums can occur. Now, now what we also talked about last time is just because I have a critical point doesn't necessarily mean that I have a minimum or a maximum. One of the examples I gave was y equals x cubed. And taking a look at this graph, the derivative would be 3x squared. And 3x squared is definitely equal to 0 at the origin, but I wouldn't say that I have a minimum or, or maximum at, at this origin. I, I just happen to have a critical point, a place where the derivative in this case is, is equal to zero. But, but this does bring up an, an interesting notion, the idea of identifying local extrema. So the situation is if I have a situation where my function goes from being increasing and then a, a critical point and then decreasing, that means that this critical point would have to be a local maximum. If I had a situation where my function was decreasing to a critical point and then increasing, that means that this critical point here would have to be a local minimum. And so this brings up some very interesting things. So. I want to take a look at a couple of examples here. The first example I want to take a look at is y equals x cubed minus 3x. So just looking at this graph, I notice a couple of things. Number one, I've got intercept at x equals 0, and over here at negative cubed root of 3, and over here at the positive cubed root of 3. If I take a look at the derivative my derivative is going to be 3x 
squared minus 3. And if I'm looking for my critical points, places where my derivative, since this polynomial is equal to 0, I find that I can factor out a 3, and I end up with x squared minus 1 being equal to 0. So x would be plus or minus 1. And that means at negative 1 and at positive 1, I'm going to have critical points. But what I really want to do is I want to identify the behavior of my derivative not just at those particular points because at negative 1 my derivative is 0 and at positive 1 my derivative is 0 but I want to want to examine my behavior for each of these intervals so, for values of x that are less than negative 1, say a ne negative 2, this derivative ends up being positive because the squared term here is going to be larger than this negative term. So, if my derivative is positive, that means that x f is increasing from negative infinity to negative 1. So in other words, my, my graph is doing this type of behavior. But for values of x between negative 1 and 1, this minus 3 term is larger than the 3x squared term. So my derivative is less than 0, which means that f is decreasing on the interval from negative 1 to 1. Now, now notice, I had a critical point at negative 1, comma, f of negative 1. And my graph was increasing and then decreasing, which means that, that this point that I have, which is negative 1, positive 2, this point is a, a relative maximum. And I can tell this without ever graphing my function. I tell this analytically, just looking at the derivative and the behavior of the derivative. So at this point, negative 1, 2, I know that this graph has to be a maximum. I, I know that for values of x less than negative 1, my graph has been increasing up to this point. And I know for values between negative 1 and 0, my, my graph is decreasing. So this, this has to be a relative maximum. And I can continue examining this because I, I know that I, I do have a, a critical point at 1 negative 2, 
I can also take a look at values for my derivative where x is greater than 1. And when x is greater than 1, this x squared term ends up dominating this minus 3 term. So my derivative is greater than 0. So that means that f is increasing on the interval from 1 to infinity. And so if, if I'm decreasing to this, this 1 comma negative 2 and then increasing, that means this 1, one negative 2 is a relative minimum. So, so I'm going to continue de decreasing until I reach 1 comma negative 2. My fun function is decreasing, but then my function starts to increase again values of x greater than 1, my function is increasing. And so this point here is a relative minimum. So I get a lot of information about the behavior of my graph just by looking at the first derivative. Because the first derivative identifies critical points, and the first derivative also identifies where my graph is increasing or decreasing. So I want to take a look at one more example. So I want to show one more example. Let's take a look at the example y equals x to the two-thirds power. So looking at this, taking a look at the derivative, I notice that y prime would be two-thirds x to the negative one-third, or over 3 times the cubed root of x. And I can't really say where the derivative is equal to 0 because a fraction is only equal to 0 when its numerator is 0. But I could say where the fraction is undefined because a fraction is undefined where its denominator is equal to zero. And, and so I, I know that when x equals zero, that's when my, my derivative does not exist. x equals zero, though, is part of the domain of my original function, because the point, point zero, zero is going to be a point on my graph. So this is a critical point. And so what I want to do is I want to examine my derivative for values on either side of 0. So for values of x that are less than 0, Zero. The cubed root of a neg negative number is negative, and two, two thirds of that number ends up being negative. So my derivative is less than zero. And because my derivative is less than zero, that means that f is de decreasing on the this interval from neg negative infinity to zero. So, so I'm decreasing to this critical point, 
and for values of x that are larger than zero, I know that the cubed root of that value would have to be positive. And two thirds times that would also be positive. So my derivative is positive for all values of x from zero to infinity. That means that f is increasing on this interval from zero to infinity. And so because my critical point is that a place where the derivative changes from negative to positive. My critical point is a place where my graph goes from being decreasing to increasing. That means that this point here, 0, 0, is a relative min. And what that means is, if I take a look at the graph of this function, this has to be a relative min, and I have to be decreasing down to this point, and then increasing for values beyond. So notice that my, my function is decreasing to this point, and then for the points larger than zero, my graph is increasing. So a critical point takes place whenever the derivative is zero or undefined, as long as that point is in our domain. But we can look at see when a function is increasing or decreasing, that information also comes to us from, from the first derivative. And so, so the first derivative provides a lot of information about, about the graph. And so, so we can use this information to, to find out about the behavior of a graph without explicitly graphing it. And so we know how a graph increases, decreases, where the relative extrema are. We can determine that analytically without having to resort to a graphing tool. That's one of the powerful ways that the calculus can be used. Once again, this is Mr. Potter. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.